Welcome to Security Heroes, a podcast by Athena Security. We share real life stories to help connect you to real heroes in the security world. I am your host, Lisa Falzone. Warning, the following recording contains potentially disturbing content. Listener discretion advised. Today, Security Heroes brings you a special two-part episode with emergency physician, Aaron Quarles. Joining me today is Dr. Aaron Quarles, an emergency medicine physician and an assistant professor in emergency medicine. He is also a board member at Facing Forward to End Homelessness. He was awarded the Zuckerman Fellowship by the Center of Public Leadership to pursue a Master of Public Policy from Harvard Kennedy School. And Aaron also earned his medical doctorate from Harvard Medical School. He is particularly interested in aligning community resources with the healthcare system to enhance the care of patients from marginalized populations. Welcome, Dr. Quarles. Happy to be here. Thanks for having me, guys. Awesome. So usually on this podcast, we have people from the security industry, but I think it's super important to hear from the doctors and nurses themselves about safety issues and heroic acts. So I'm just really excited to have you on and to hear your perspective as really we are protecting you as the emergency doctor and your patients and the nurses. So um, so just to start off with, what sparked your interest in pursuing a career as an ER doc? Uh, that's uh, one that I've written many, many essays about over the years uh, in terms of, you know, admissions essays and whatnot. I think, you know, I, I, it all started, I grew up in a pretty like low income environment, grew up in a, a place where, you know, education was always something we wanted to achieve, but not always something available for folks in uh, the family, the community. And I got really fortunate. Somehow with school, I just had all these wonderful opportunities to kind of make it to different levels of education. And I think the combination of, you know, interesting things I've seen, science, the communities I served, my my fear that I would be a failure as a teacher, because <laughs> like I think that's the most important, you know, career of all time, somehow like drew me to medicine. And I, and I didn't initially start off wanting to be a doc. I had uh, in a lot of ways, you know, in and experience the emergency department by being a, a clumsy boy who, you know, got into trouble sometimes as a, as a youth and found myself really, as I was kind of going through that college phase, trying to figure it all out. And some particularly moving experiences, particularly through some like clinical shadowing, put me into a child psychiatric unit, actually. And I, and I had always thought like psychology is actually like my undergrad major. Uh-huh. Uh, I'd always had an interest in kind of mental health mm-hmm. And a lot of that like came from, you know, things I'd seen in my own family and neighborhood growing up. Mm-hmm. And so kind of in that experience, a lot of a lot of the, the the patients that we saw were coming through the emergency department. There was a crisis being had. Well, carry forward through to medical school. You kind of have other experiences and you go through a wide array of, you know, existential crises in medical school, trying to figure out what you want to be. And I always caught myself still being drawn to this like idea of the emergency or the idea of the crisis. Uh, And in particular, a lot of that passion was further developed as we go to, you know, med students are looking for a free lunch. Uh, especially since we got all those loans to pay back. Um, But I found myself kind of drawn towards professors, like physicians who had these multifaceted lives. And so I remember one in particular uh, was a physician who's currently, you know, chair out on the East Coast of of his department now, uh, giving a lecture, a lunch talk on his experience in doing a lot of global health work and, and humanitarian work during the Haiti earthquake. And he was an emergency physician. I was like, well, how does a doctor have time to go do that? I remember another experience with a uh, early mentor uh, who was an emergency physician, but spent most of his time, half of his year, uh, because his wife is Italian, building, like going to Italy and helping design and build and lead emergency medicine uh, mm-hmm. training. Program. And so that 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 flexibility of the lifestyle, the presence of the you know immediate crisis, being able to kind of come and go, uh, never knowing what you're going to get. There's a certain sense of like fun and interesting and, and all the TV shows are emergency medicine. And so I started to yeah. just get drawn, right? Uh, when you when it gets down to the brass tacks and you start going on rotations and whatnot, emergency medicine, as I gained more knowledge about it and and put myself into more experiences can gain that exposure throughout medical school, uh, I found to be the one place where 
in all of American healthcare, you have to be able to take care of every single person that walks in, what, what, no matter what they look like, how much they make, where they're from, what their language is, mm-hmm. what their complaint is, or their disease process is. I love the idea of taking care of pediatric patients and geriatric patients. I love mm-hmm. taking care of CEOs and patients who are experiencing homelessness. And so there's, there's a wide world of stuff that happens in the emergency department. And with all that stuff, there's a wide world of opportunities to make improvements in the way we do things, to think about the communities, like the far-reaching community. I think the emergency department's the canary in the coal mine. You look at COVID, we knew about this stuff coming in before many of other, our other colleagues throughout the healthcare system, right, in other industries. And so... I think the emergency department at once allows you an exciting, interesting, constantly changing, uh, a bit chaotic, stressful, and sometimes violent uh, Mm -hmm. experience, but also unearths a lot of, you know, patterns of disease and community issues out there, uh, really interesting opportunities and ways to think about what the value of medicine is and healthcare. Uh, And it's a really fun, interesting job. And it's something that allows me the flexibility to have other kinds of roles where I have some academic roles. I work in, yeah. you know, you mentioned facing forward. Uh, that's a wonderful opportunity I've been able to kind of find. And it, and it seems like emergency positions and the way they, they set their careers up, many of them, was the only way I was going to be able to satisfy both my, I want to save lives and help people itch while also thinking about the big longer term problems or more systemic issues and challenges. And so it's a nice balance between that immediate gratification and long term gratif- uh, satisfaction uh, that can come from things like, you know, real time clinic, like bedside care, but also long term things like research, education, policy, advocacy. And so it was a really nice natural bedfellow for me. And I'm, I'm very happy I made that choice. That's awesome. It seems like you're so passionate about it. So. I'm really excited to talk to you. Um, Most days. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, <laughs> I went result. to the emergency room like a year ago because of RSV, actually. Mm-hmm. And um, I was like, I, it just gave me a new appreciation. I was like, I'm just so thankful we have this. It's like a safety net in society. And I just was also in awe of all the ER docs. And I was like, this this is like such a fun job. This seems like a really cool, but like really stressful, but fun job. It's, um, it's mostly fun. Like, and it's yeah. mostly I had a mentor once said, you know, you know, you had a good shift. If you laughed, you, you cried and you learned something like yeah. that is you know, exactly what the emergency department is, no matter what, where you are in the country, you never know what you're going to get. Yeah. I've never wanted to be a doctor, but I was like, oh, you know, maybe emergency room would be really cool. So um, kind of like has that adrenaline rush. And that's kind of why I'm an entrepreneur is like, I love the adrenaline rush. I'm not knowing what's going to happen. And I felt like the ER had the same vibe. So, um, but yeah, um, yeah, I know you talked about a lot of interesting things, um, in, in in that response, um, one being mental health, um, which I would love to talk to you more Mm -hmm. about because it's something we talk about on this podcast. And I think it, you know, if we can solve that issue or can help solve that issue, it's one of the keys to solving violence in the ER and just in general. (laughs) Yeah. What'd you say? Sorry. I think it would solve all of the issues in society if we yeah. all you know better access to mental health and like totally. actually this. There's a lot, a lot that goes on that I think you know people would benefit from yeah. the resources that don't really exist or reach many of the patients that do end up in the emergency department. Yeah, and so, and we talk a lot with security professionals and just approaching mm-hmm. these people that are potentially violent with empathy versus combativeness is just super key. It's like, wow, you can diffuse a situation by just approaching it with empathy. Um, I just think find that really fascinating. But um, anyway, so tell me about a firsthand experience where you responded to an emergency situation that was life threatening. So like in the emergency department, anything's going to happen at any time. And Mm so you can have a shift where you know things are going you know pretty quiet and then all of a sudden you get you know four car accidents or four gunshot wound victims and you know every single day in fact there is something life-threatening that's bringing the many many patients that emergency departments across the country all see right and regardless of what the actual clinical environment is in those patients mind they are having a life-threatening emergency and and i think part of that's needed to say because you know it I think it leads into some of the further conversation that we'll have uh, down the line. But I think there's something about the system and something about how difficult it is to like access other things that brings a lot of patients to the emergency department, even if they're trying to go through the system. 
So what we see at, at my, I work at Northwestern, we're at quaternary care level, like quaternary level, like highest level academic medicine. Sorry, I can't say that word. Uh, you know, and, and you're, you're seeing patients with diseases, conditions, have recent procedures that are like on the cutting edge, frontline stuff you've never even heard about. So every single day, uh, whether it's heart attacks, uh, gunshots, uh, you know, people not having appropriate medications, overdoses on drugs, mm-hmm. uh, you know, in my eyes and what I think about a lot, the danger of poverty uh, and the violence mm-hmm. and all of, you know, homelessness. We, we are dealing with all the, you know, migrants that are being sent here and not having places to go. And in emergency departments and criminal justice system tend to be the two places or the street tend to be the three places that people kind of mix up with that often mm-hmm. are. One recent uh, very concerning experience that we had, just to, to give an example, is uh, one of the sickest patients I've had this year and in, in my entire career, actually, was a young woman who had gone to one of our music festivals in the city. Uh, and it was a hot day and it's super, you know, very, very predictable that on big, you know, festival days or big events and parades and things like that, the emergency department, particularly the one that's near that, is going to be inundated with patients. And as predicted, I'm on the high acuity side of our department that day. Uh, we started getting patients kind of intermittently coming from this event with drug overdoses, heat exhaustion, overheating. Uh, and this one patient in particular came in and she uh, had overdosed in the context of like in, in the festival, having a bunch mm-hmm. of, you know, some drugs were on board. Uh, and she came in with a really fascinating and kind of scary and critically like dangerous condition called serotonin syndrome. And it is particularly something that you'll see on these hot days festivals. Folks are overdosing on things like Molly uh, and mm-hmm. BMA, that kind of stuff. And one of the key features of this condition is seizures, uh, as well as very, very high temperatures. And it's not like a fever, like from an infection. It is like a neurologically and hormonally charged fever that gets out of proportion. And so this girl's temperature was 109 degrees. Oh, That's the hottest number I've ever seen a human survive. And fortunately, it's a good story. She, she makes it in that. But while we saw her, she came in in status epilepticus, which is nonstop seizing. Uh, we had to quickly try to treat that seizure relatively fat, like in, within short order, intubate her, put a breathing tube in. Because if you're seizing and not breathing and aspirating and choking on things, uh, that can be a life-threatening event in and of itself. Uh, once we were able to do that, anytime you intubate somebody, that procedure is dangerous. You're taking away a lot of their physiology to kind of support them and kick over it. And that leads to a variety of different challenges the rest of your body organ systems are seeing. And we got our temperature and all of us thought that like, there's no way it's this hot. I had to have the medical student go over to our ice machine and load bags and bags and bags of ice. We had to end up, you know, sending this patient to the ICU. She had numerous, you know, her organs took a, took a pretty serious hit. Uh, but recently, just the other day, got got told that uh, she was left out of the hospital in very, very good condition with good neurologic recovery, talking. And, and again, she was awesome. And so I was very grateful that we were able to kind of work as a team during that period of time yeah. to manage to get this person the high level of critical care they need. Outside of that, while that's happening, many other patients are still coming in. Ambulances are still coming in. The patients that are in the waiting room are getting more and more you know, frustrated with waiting. Uh, and some of our patients, particularly the psych patients, intoxicated patients are starting to get a little bit more antsy and rowdy. And so that happens every single day. And when you leave mm-hmm. that day, focus on that one patient, there may be 50 other things that you have to kind of pay attention to right afterwards. And that's mm-hmm. the reason I'm very grateful that I only work eight-hour shifts. <laughs> yeah. What was the violence and and what happened exactly? Uh, so as that kind of as, as I'm just that's an example of oh, okay, got it. See, but like while that's happening, while you're focused, while your whole care team is focused on really doing a lot of intensive work to try to to resuscitate someone and save them, everything else is still going on in the emergency department. Yeah. Patients still coming in. Uh, patients are getting angsty and, and angry. And a lot of, you know, as we get into the conversation of violence comes from kind of this uncertainty that patients have. They're sick. They're on a scary day. And yeah, yeah. Like, oh, where's my doctor? I haven't been updated. Right, right, right. Like, that's again, yeah. Some of this kind of stuff comes in. Add on mental health, substance yeah. use, whatever. That stuff starts to get out. of And staff concerns with other folks that so things aren't being watched. You start to kind of see how some of this stuff can kind of build up. Uh, totally. Like, overwhelming so did that so did that situation when that 
uh, per, that woman came in with a 109 degree fever. Did it, did it spark violence in the waiting room or? It didn't necessarily spark that. We're a yeah. very emergency department, big enough yeah. to have like separate geographic teams in the emergency department. So like what's happening on our team is kind of what we're referring to, but Got as it. that thing, you know, there's still 50 or 60 people in the waiting room. There's still ambulances coming yeah, in. Yeah. And, in and of itself didn't spark it but yeah. you walk out of that and you're flustered and you're like you know that adrenaline rush of trying to yeah. save life and actually succeeding is really amazing and you need to kind of settle but you pop back out and there's you know nurses that need things and patients need things and sure. some of the milieu of the emergency department as you experienced recently is constant it is, yeah. it is chaos and it's yeah. sometimes done well beautiful controlled chaos but like this pic painting behind me a print of a basket it is a very, very complicated and, you know, sure. you know, environment most of the time. And when you have something like violence or disruption or, you know, sick patients, it disrupts whatever interconnected issues happening in the yeah. rest of the Yeah. It's also interesting how hot days, like, I mean, I think there's been studies like hot days are more likely to cause, um, like there's more homicides yeah. on hot days. And, Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, can you, are you able to talk about some specific instances of, of, of some violence that you had to deal with in the ER? Well, I mean, if you ask any, like, I've had several experiences and I don't know, one extreme, and I can jump into that story that you probably know about and probably referring yeah. to, actually was as a, a trainee uh, involved with a patient who had a, a gun. Yeah. But that was, you know, the most, you know, extreme. And we can start off with very common things. So right. just the other day, uh, we had a patient who was brought in with alcohol intoxication. Mm. Uh, and as people are often brought in with alcohol intoxication, they're often unaware of exactly what happened to lead them to get into the emergency department in the first place. And this particular patient had, I was coming into work and I saw one of my uh, emergency department techs, like one of our ancillary staff that kind of helps kind of very visibly emotionally distraught. Uh, kind of tearful. And I was like, what, what just happened? And she was like, well, this patient, you know, we're trying to, you know, help de-escalate her. She was drunk, screaming, kind of going nuts. Uh, and she, at some point, kicked me in the face, right? Uh, and in order to restrain patients, you often have to use force, security, chemical restraint. We can get into some of those things. Uh, but that was just one example. And that example mm. happens every single day. And kind of yeah. looking a little bit before starting this, uh, or like before, before we hopped on the Zoom, you know, there's an ASAP, ASAP is the American College of Emergency Physicians survey sent out to emergency physicians. And some of the stats that came from this survey report, 85% of emergency physicians believe the violence they've experienced in the emergency department has increased over the past five years. Uh, two thirds of the emergency physicians and you can and staff like at the bedside, like nurses and techs are certainly the ones that get far more of the brunt of it because they're right there in the front of it. Yeah. Period. Hands down. But if two thirds of emergency physicians are reporting being assaulted in the past year alone, uh, and one third with more, like, re like more than once, like that's a bit of a concerning environment. And obviously, our nurses and other patients and whatnot are seeing it. Other specific examples, you know, I've had patients or residents and trainees that I'm supervising go speak to patients in a room and then all of a sudden you hear a commotion and there's they're getting hit and, and punched by a patient particularly you know again intoxicated and, and mental health patients unfortunately those in crisis tend to be the ones that this is most common yeah. uh, i had a patient where uh, i had you know when you come on to a shift you take sign out from the leaving the, the team leaving before you so you assume responsibility for whoever's on your team and i had a patient who had been and this fits into some of the some of the issues and frustrations that we all have in the emergency department who had been languishing in the emergency department, waiting for a bed upstairs. This is a process when we, we see a patient, we decide they need to be admitted to the hospital. And then with, they're admitted, but then they're waiting for a long time to actually leave the ER and go to their bed upstairs in the hospital. That right. period of time, they're called boarders. They're boarding in the emergency department. And this contributes to a lot of problems, a lot of bad medical outcomes, a lot of issues, strains on the staff. I'm not an inpatient medicine doctor. I don't want to be doing inpatient medicine. Uh, yeah. There's a reason we go into emergency medicine, right? And this patient was a mother of a patient who had been there for something like 20, 20 hours in a hallway bed because there's just no other space to keep seeing all that constant onset of patients. And for some reason, when this patient 
Vincent's mom like woke up from napping, uh, was really upset why things weren't moving uh, as quickly as she had hoped. And I went over to, you know, as a supervising doc on that team and then decided to, you know, let her know the update. This is what's going on. Let her know that I would try to get another bed. But every single one in the department here is facing the same scenario as your daughter. And I want to assure you that you're getting the care uh, that yeah. you deserve. Rather quickly, her tone and posture changed and began squ- screaming, cussing, you know, calling me all kinds of names that didn't make any sense. And for the next couple hours, while I was trying to care for other patients at work, managing I'm getting verbal assaults with no real physical barriers of protection. I'm getting interruptions by nurses that make me see things. My residents and students are asking me things about uh, how to you know, move the care forward for this patient or that patient. And, and, and I'm just taking verbal abuse to the point mm-hmm. where eventually security has to escort this person out. And it can get complicated because hospital yeah. security. The, you know, some of the, the challenges they have with regard to not being police and then, you know, right. having to file things that can slow things down and make it make it a problem. Uh, we've had a lot of our patients who come in uh, another one just two weeks ago uh, who, you know, threatens, you know, violence and screams and cusses, racial slurs, these things that, you know, in a diverse work environment are not very safe for anyone to hear. This is violence. Uh, had to get arrested after, you know, consistently assaulting like a nurse like, or excuse me, striking a nurse in the face um, in, on our shift. You know, the, these things happen every single day and every single ER constantly. And they probably outside of the emergency department too, in other healthcare settings, you know, less likely in a clinic probably, but even inpatient hospitals, mental health facilities. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and it can just get exhausting. We all talk about burnout, but there are so many examples where you could just walk into the emergency department thinking you're going to have a regular shift. And then, you know, the one very tragic experience that, you know, kind of was occurring at the same time at my most concerning violent experience that I had as a, as a, as a, uh, around that time, there was a domestic violence situation at another emergency department where the husband came in and literally shot a few people and killed them in a Chicago emergency department because he was targeting his wife, who was a physician there. Uh, this is common. This happens all the time, and we don't talk enough about it. Um, but it's certainly something that uh, every single day I can. And it's why it's hard to give you a very specific one, because I can think of that's so crazy. So this husband came in and shot to another ER because oh, another had, ER. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Had, with a domestic dispute with his partner uh, yeah. and people, you know, she was the primary target and he succeeded in what he did. Oh, and my gosh. You Horrible. You were victimized. That same thing, like that time that happened, this was like 2019. I believe 2020, early 2020, uh, was around the time I had been at my own like training site where I was getting, uh, you know, the opportunity to kind of run the team by myself as a graduating fourth year chief resident. Mm. Uh, and this, I don't want to like give the name of the place, but they're, you know, my own experience with being having a gun pulled on me by a patient uh, happened two days after this happened. Like, oh, wow. and so this was fresh in all of our minds and, and certainly part of the conversation around. You know, what do we need to do to keep our residents safe? What do we need yeah. to do to our patients safe, our staff? How do we how do we figure these things out in a more strategic way? Uh, but there's constant incentives and, and challenges like, well, we don't want to put metal detectors here because it doesn't look nice. And mm. we don't want our, our patients who are high paying patients and folks who have their names on walls and stuff to have to see metal detectors when they come in. Well, I want to be alive. <laughs> I want yeah. to be able to yeah. work it up. Care, you know, and I think that's right. a really frustrating experience that I think many of our colleagues across the nation are, are going to be, if you ask any of them, very familiar with. Yeah, you, we do weapon detection. It's like when we put it in one of these, you know, ERs, it's like we get so much like gratitude from the doctors and the nurses and the security staff. They're like, thank God some of the hospital is finally doing something. And um, and so it's and I, I don't really think the patients care, you know. Yeah. And it's, yeah. it's hard to say, but it's such a you know, it's such a frustrating tension that I think a yeah. lot of feel in the emergency department in particular, because you right. have this job where you're trying to do the most good for the most people and spread the resources that you have. And those resources being your time, your mm-hmm. whatever imaging, like tests, whatever, uh, yeah. the most people in need. And often those incentives are not aligned for a variety of reasons uh, and often clash with some of these other high priority incentives that many organizations care about, like customer service, patients yeah. and things that do really sometimes make it hard 
or you know, cut your feet out from you in terms of being able to protect your team in a moment of crisis, right? Or, or in those scenarios. And so a lot of what happens is you get an hour long module on how to, you know, be a person, how to, how to deal with a, uh, oh my God, what are they called? I'm thinking of the shooter thing. <laughs> like what's, what are they Active called? Active shooter. Active shooter situation. Yeah. So they teach you interesting mnemonics and then you have to check a box. And they, like, these are a lot of the things you do, but you, in the years I, I got to my residency program in 2015, and I stayed on as a faculty member and uh, in the eight years, eight and a half years or so that I've been around, I've seen our security team increase in size number. I've seen their equipment go from, you know, basic button down shirts to now Kevlar vests. I've seen, uh, you know, we now have a weapons detection dog walking around uh, department, which is something new this year. Uh, We do have metal detectors that are kind of somewhere in the, in the doors on still of our emergency department from what I've been told. But they don't have them in the ambulance today. And there is, uh, uh, and that's important because it kind of gets into the same issue that I had uh, when I was uh, facing a gun in the emergency department myself. But, um, and that's again, an extreme example of violence. I, I really want to nail down that violence in the emergency departments is the verbal abuse, the physical abuse, the slaps, the hits, the kicks, the bites, the screams that happen every single day console year. It's not always guns in the emergency department. Sure. But it's insane the amount of mm-hmm. stuff that. We see I've had patients brought into the uh, trauma bay through the ambulance doors because, again, there's no thing. And we have a wand to try to wand them down. And, you know, I, I confiscated a machete from a patient. Oh, wow. That's and crazy. I'm like, Where did you get a machete? And they, yeah. they gave it really, they weren't by this, like just their machete. And they're a person who's, you know, out on the, you know, living on the streets. And so they right. were trying to protect themselves. And so, you know, it sucks that that's the society we live in in, in, in many ways. But it, it, it just goes to show that as you're kind of trying to take care of your patients and, and just do the medical thing, guns fall out of pockets, knives fall out of pockets. Sure. You go through the doors with a security, like you might not even know that somebody has anything and it can mm. be a challenge. So. Totally. Um, yeah. So do you want to talk about that time that you had to deal with someone <laughs> pulling a, a gun out? On yeah. You? So- Absolute wild experience. And, you know, I, again, I grew up in an environment where like I've seen violence, you know, in my mind, I thought I was like comfortable with it (laughs) Uh, to the, to the toxic way of being comfortable. Like I've seen this kind of stuff. And so I'm kind of used to some of these things, but I remember, so I was uh, working an overnight shift at one of our our practice sites. uh, And uh, it was, it, as you're going through residence, you gain like a lot more autonomy. And like, especially at this point in time, I was getting ready to graduate. So I was like a chief resident, a senior resident. Mm. Uh, like a few months away from having a real job, you know? Yeah. And so my attending at the time was taking a break. They were, they were somewhere else. And I was excited about this and I'm running around trying to take care of all the patients. And this break, like this happened right after we had, unfortunately had a very, very uh, severe, traumatic and ultimately life, life ending gunshot victim who had come in just moments before. And so we're managing this patient as best we can, trying to resuscitate. And as with all kind of violent issues that happen in the emergency department, police will show up to kind of take a report, right, and, and be available. Well, fortunately for me in this scenario, there was a police officer in the emergency department uh, for that particular patient, you know, who had expired after a very, very bad gut shot wounds. Uh, well, I'm going back to my little fishbowl, trying to work on my notes and, you know, trying to go see the next patient and EMS brings in a patient. Uh, and there's not a lot of communication sometimes when you're in one room and the EMS person's dropping someone off, the nurses are taking a report, but by the time things get to you, sometimes it's like a game of telephone. And -hmm. certainly when you, you know, while I'm on my way to being an attending physician, I'm also and experienced enough. I'm also very inexperienced compared to everyone else and like don't know what to ask or don't know what I don't know in a lot of ways. Yeah. And so at this time, this patient's coming in and very, very typical, seemed exactly like every other, you know, alcohol intoxicated patient I'd ever dealt with. And I had at this time been a very big fan of verbal de-escalation. Uh, trying to think about how to talk to patients and not rile them up. Sometimes you'll see patients get very angry and all they're trying to do is go to the bathroom. And sometimes sure. we sit in these combative arguments. And, and so I, I, I really kind of focused a lot on that as a trainee because I didn't like the immediate like sedating and restraining people and kind of taking their rights and creating adversarial stuff. So I, yeah. I always yeah. love challenge of a verbal de-escalation. And it's often sometimes funny. Like sometimes you just you have funny conversations with people. Yeah. 
uh, trying to maintain their sense of autonomy and give them choices and ability to empower themselves in those moments. But ultimately, when they don't have capacity to make good choices, you have to assume that capacity for them, right, in a variety of different ways. And so in this patient, I was doing it with some success, and he was kind of, you know, drunk and trying to get up and leave his bed. What we don't want is for somebody to fall and hit their head or mm. interrupt the patient or violate privacy. And so uh, I, I, I get him settled and I go see another patient. And then as I come out of this room, I see our, our patient who I had just settled, fully dressed, like walking out of the emergency department, walking up and down the hall of the emergency department and kind of going in and out, like trying to figure out where he is and accidentally going into patient rooms. And again, very drunk like just the drunk, like drunk, <laughs> like so drunk. Uh, and so as I'm trying to talk to him, very fortunately, where I was in the hallway and where he was, the police officer from the incident before happened to just be standing right next to me. And so as I am trying to, again, verbally deescalate this patient and get him to, you know, back to his room where he's safe, where the other patients are safe, where we're safe, uh, all of a sudden, he decides to sit in a chair that was randomly there mm-hmm. and out of nowhere, pulls a gun and points it right at me. And so I don't know what kicked in. I used to run track in high school, but I wasn't that fast, but I, I booked it. And, and it was a natural reflex. I got away. I, I actually screened shooter uh, for folks because I took that module <laughs> and it just kind of kicked in. So maybe yeah. those models are effective. But I, re- I recall this scenario ending immediately, uh, ra- rather immediately. Because within seconds of me sprinting that way, the the trained police officer had already drawn his pistol and other police were already kind right. of making their way into the scenario. Uh, and it, my, my supervising doc at the time also was walking in, but was completely unaware of what was going on. And I was like, get over here. This guy's got a gun. He's like, what the hell did you do? Like, I was gone for like 10 minutes. And so like, it, it, it was a crazy story. And so this was this experience. And, and, and in a moment's notice, I'm trying to manage all these patients. I'm getting it ready to start this career that I've been wanting to do my whole life. And at the moment of, of like doing success, like feeling good about it, I almost, I could have lost my life. I could have been severely mm. injured. I could have had, you know, all kinds of matter of things that could happen. And that stuff kind of goes through your head, right? A little bit. Mm. What was really frustrating in the retrospective of this and kind of talking about it and, and whatnot in reviewing more and trying to understand what happened, how this happened and, and, and all towards trying to figure out how to prevent these things from happening again, obviously. Uh, it was discovered that the patient had had a gun that was actually confiscated by EMS at the scene. Uh, mm-hmm. So this was his second gun. Uh, and one of the frustrating things that came out of that was, well, it, had I gotten the patient undressed, mm-hmm. had we put the patient in a gown, had we taken his belongings and secured them in a secure location, we may have discovered or identified the gun that he mm-hmm. had at that moment, but we didn't do or didn't have like an, enough of a sense to do at the time. Yeah, it's an overnight shift, short, like a little bit of a more, you know, uh, uh, light staff in, in some ways. That's just kind of uh-huh. how uh, we're the only place it's 24 seven, but everything else in the world isn't, you know, and so you, you end up with a lot uh, of challenges, particularly at night. And I think, you know, it was very frustrating to me that this lack of communication, EMS could have told us or somebody like my uh-huh. the nurse, or somebody, uh, and they probably did, but I didn't get that information. Had I known that, I would have had a very different approach to interacting with this patient. Uh, the uh, the fact that just very basic things like taking a patient, helping a patient get into a gown when they come into the emergency department, this should just be standard. And that's not right. even security. That's just good medicine. You go to your primary care doctor and you have to put a gown on and, and they do way less intensive physical exams than some of the things we're doing in the emergency department. And mm-hmm. so- it's it's a very interesting thing that like the simple solutions didn't even get to the level of security. And even still, there could have been more dangerous things like that that happened. And I think having those conversations and having that experience really was, you know, personally a bit challenging and stuff that I got over it, but also kind of invigorating. And it, it led to a lot of conversations in our training program, the hospital and other ways around how to better identify potential threats, better train staff to deal with potential threats uh, and prepare for all this. And it was all going and it was like picking up steam and the leaders of the hospital are kind of thinking about new committees and, and starting stuff and then COVID happens. And so obviously a shift of perspectives and, 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 and things we need to focus on absolutely appropriately pendulumed up that way. But what we're seeing now is especially after COVID, especially with kind of some of the increasing challenges we're seeing managing patients, dealing with borders, the overflow of all of it, the violence is getting up there. Like you're seeing a lot more of these kind of 
smaller acts or you're not seeing people, you know, bring guns every single day. But I can tell you, I know countless times, anytime we have a, anytime we have a level one trauma, which is a gunshot wound, stab wound, a severe, like violent trauma, penetrating trauma, we have to go on lockdown. We lock our emergency departments down, mm-hmm. particularly the city of Chicago, because we know retaliation might come. So while you're trying to save someone's life or manage something, you have to worry about whether or not family members, neighborhood, you know, folks will show up and try to do something about it. And so mm-hmm. it's a chaotic environment, particularly with this kind of stuff. And I think that uh, as you kind of board and, and, and value, like, you know, try to think about solutions for it, sometimes it's really the simple things. Did we just get them naked? <laughs> Put them in a gown. Did yeah. We, you know, have a conversation about do they even need to be in the emergency department? If we had better processes to get the patient out of the emergency department and they weren't boarding, would they have gotten so angry because they're sleeping in a hallway? And so I, I tend to think a lot about that kind of stuff um, because that's what I can control as not the boss or the person or purchaser of, you know, any services that we, we yeah. provide department. I'm really just the doc trying to take care of folks. And, and so like, I, I, that's where I, I get a lot of curiosity around that stuff. But I'd be interested in like what you've heard or some of your thoughts around, you know, some of the things that I've been kind of mentioning in regard to this. It's, it's crazy. I think it's complex. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. It's for sure. Uh, complicated. I, I've also just being in hospitals um, just for like loved ones. I've noticed just, com- just like basic communication issues. Was it solved? Like, can you guys now communicate with the EM- EMS? Would you, can you just define exactly what EMS stands for? Oh, yeah. Uh, services, ambulance, think paramedics, yeah, ambulance, yeah. Uh, EMTs. And so, uh, you know, in Chicago, we have a, uh, the Chicago Fire Department actually is the EMS service. It brings most of the patients, and there are some private ambulance companies and whatnot. This wasn't yeah. actually in Chicago uh, when this event occurred. It occurred when I was uh, out in Gary, Indiana. Um, and the the systems and a lot of the communication so the communication exists like the traditional way that the ems shows up is to give a handoff to someone this is mm-hmm. what we saw the team, this is what the vitals were blah 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 and that probably happened like cons- like appropriately in some way mm-hmm. but it didn't get to me and it's not necessarily something that we always think so Every time the emergency, you go to the emergency department, we're going to screen you on suicide, domestic violence, uh, safety at home, and these kinds of things. We're, all of them. Every, no right. matter what you're in the ER for, you're getting screened for that. Do you have firearms at home if you're in a pediatric ER? These things kind of come up, right? Right. They don't come up often in the way a patient presents for something. Because if I come in here for chest pain, and I told EMS I had chest pain, uh, and they brought me to the emergency department and I have chest pain, but I'm, you know, somehow hiding a weapon or having mm-hmm. something, you know, pockets of my pants. I'm not necessarily, you know, going to think as the doctor or the care provider, the nurse, whatever, yeah. to ask about what's going on with their legs or take a clothes. You, you might not, right? Like there's not necessarily a reason to, uh, or more, more accurately, sometimes there's so much information, so many patients, you don't have time to look at all the notes. If there was a run sheet from EMS that kind of detailed the events that they pulled this off, blah, 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 uh, that we identified a gun. And it's like, if that was in some easy way for me to see in the EMR or uh-huh. something before entering the patient's room, maybe. Uh, yeah. We're really good with things like when somebody's got a respiratory virus that is highly transmittable, like COVID, identifying the person's got COVID, being able to kind of put up protections and then therefore, you know, now the rest of the team who's been properly trained knows how to act accordingly, face mm. mask, right? There's not enough, fortunately, of events like guns and knives and stuff constantly happening in the same vein as the less kind of like scary violent events, right? The verbal, the right. physical, like the hand-to-hand kind of stuff that we see quite a bit of. Well, you'd think it, you would just have like a bold asterisk. And when you say EMR, do you mean like Electronic. EPIC? Like yeah, the like EPIC, EPIC system? Yeah. yeah. But you would think that there would be, okay, like this is something that you should bold underlying asterisk. Like this has been involved, this person has been involved in a gun violence case, right? Exactly. If you could do it with COVID, you should be able to do it with exactly. gun violence. And, yeah. a, and a lot of times this stuff is hard, right? Like, so mm-hmm. when you add layers of the electronic medical record, which is beautiful because of all the data, mm-hmm. but it's crazy because of all the data. If you sat mm-hmm. and looked at it, you wouldn't even know where to look. There's so many buttons. And right. I was just 
or I helped train our docs like to like, you know, make some extra money as a resident. But I learned Epic and learned a lot of, you know, tips and tricks on it. And I still struggle to find things in an efficient and timely manner, regardless yeah. of what I'm doing. And so what yeah. the usual thing with these these types of patients, particularly ones that lead to actual issues that uh, like of harm, injury, where patients are getting or where where we do file charges and uh, get the police involved, you will have to go through a committee like process for patient chart advisories to be updated in that patient's chart. Uh, and so on the home screen of that patient's chart, so to say, it'll be a flag that says violent behavior alert. Mm -hmm. And there's some details there kind of in a, in a shorthand in some ways. And so you can get those on, on your patient, but the number of those that happen on patients is few. The teeth they have to prevent being able to kind of do something or to, to prevent this patient from even coming to the emergency department. Wow. We're obligated by EMTALA, which is the Emergency Medicine, Medical Treatment uh, and Labor Act of 1986, which mandates that all emergency departments or all Medicare funded uh, uh, places that deliver health care and have emergency departments are required to see everyone who shows up for anything regardless of their ability to pay. It's a great, you know, philosophy. Uh, and it prevented a lot of the really particularly horrible practices of patient dumping, you know, a private hospital gets a patient who's uninsured, they stabilize them and then move them to a county hospital and dump them there. And so you, you kind of, it's realigning yeah. some resources with folks that need the care and making sure we're not being highly inequitable. But what it also does is puts us in scenarios where I have to take care of this patient. I have to manage the, my abuser. I have to take care of this assaulting us. And so sometimes it can be really tricky and there's just not a lot going on for, you know, at the bedside often in the moment that we can do and all of the chart advisories or things that you can do often take a long time and happen after the fact. And so the best ways are what kinds of, you know, techniques can we learn as physicians and providers to better verbally deescalate, understand the situations of patients, do protect ourselves in the room? Even I have conversations with residents all the time. I noticed that you were standing very close to this patient who seemed very aggressive and you didn't seem to notice it. I want you to next time give yourself a little space because that was a very concerning for me because I just could imagine this, you know, intoxicated or very angry patient reaching out to you very easily and being able mm. to make contact. And so, like, these are conversations I'm having instead of what's the best antibiotic to use for a hospital acquired pneumonia, yeah. and the, right? And that's not just not what we should be, right? Or not what you should be doing. Family members, right? Like, this is just not. So. so, if someone's abusing you, you're forced by this act, and you said 1986 to. Yeah, you know, I probably was a bit, you know, grand yeah. in that. We yeah. have to take, take care of patients who sure. show up, right? From a medical legal liability standpoint. And it, the requirement is for a medical screening examination, and then to make sure that the patient is stabilized. So you don't have to treat and cure every condition. You have to, though, make sure that this person is safe. And so there are instances where a patient will come in intoxicated, you know, in crisis, whatever, and have some violent interactions or exchanges with, with staff, and you try to discharge that patient or actually have security assist and escort said patient out only for them to be right back hours later on your same shift. Hmm. Again, toxically, you know, intoxicated, you know, verbally abusive, hmm. very aggressive, and, and you have to do it again and then again Jeez. and again. It happens particularly, and let's just be very clear, that like, the people doing the violence are often people sick too. They're not yeah. necessarily making rational choices. Sure. They don't have capacity to make choices in the moments that they're doing a lot of this stuff. Doesn't excuse it. But as providers and caregivers, we want to help people who are sick. Uh, you imagine yeah. an elder, your, your grandmother could get a urinary tract infection. She could get delirious and she could become violent yeah. and strike staff. And is this the same kind of violence? Well, it shouldn't be tolerated. I shouldn't necessarily have to do that. My nurse shouldn't necessarily have to take that you know, punch or that bite or that kick. Right. But at the same time, is it the same as somebody who's purposefully, you know, trying to come in and, and that stuff can get murky and difficult. Totally. To understand. And so like with yeah. some scenarios, it takes a lot of legal work and a lot of stuff that, you know, the lawyers and folks that know way more about this stuff than I ever will or ever want to. Uh, but it does take quite a bit to be able to ban someone from a hospital or keep them off of the premises. Right. And that mm -hmm. requires, you know, documentation of the violence charges, these chartered virus reason by the time, you know, anything actually comes with teeth. 
this person may have been able to verbally or physically uh, assault hundreds of, of staff by the time they you know made it right. through their, to that end consequence. Yeah, I mean, you have to have some empathy for the pate. Like, mm-hmm. I know that they're verbally assaulting you and physically assaulting you. It's horrible. But I think about like, oh, if my child, like I'm a mother, if one of my, if my kid was in there and I had to, I probably would do whatever it took to make sure my kid is okay. Right. (laughs) Look, I hate to admit it, but (laughs) I'm not going to lie. I, you know, if someone I love is, you know, getting to run around or (laughs) feeling like something's wrong, you know, the, the problem is, you know, a lot of the stuff that we're doing in the emergency department and the things that really frustrate people is. One, the weight, the weight, the weight, and the weight is contributed right. to by boarding, volume, lack of access, a variety of reasons why the weight is right. weight or any kind of care is good. But if you're waiting in the emergency department, that's usually good for you. We're usually paying a lot of attention to people who are in bad shape, very, very bad shape, mm. or paying a lot of attention to people who can cause lots of problems. And so in a in a in one of this one of the strategies or one of the things that we have to deal with and you and you have a lot of empathy for a lot of the patients but again I think so deeply about our mental health patients patients mm. who have years of trauma living on the streets with trauma in and out of criminal justice with their own traumas a trauma informed approach to some of this could be ideal for many folks but it's not and so uh, it, it's just not easy to do for every scenario and, and get uh, everybody involved. And so sometimes you just have to make decisions mm-hmm. to keep it safe. So we have gone in a similar time frame as I talked about the security guard uniform changes and you know equipment and dogs. Well, we've had a growth and change in our physical uh, emergency department where when I started, there was a psych milieu, the behavioral health suite, where mm-hmm. we were able to have three patients in kind of a psychiatric, uh, so they don't have medical needs, they don't need monitors, they don't need a significant amount of blood work or medications. And it was a quiet, safe place where they can be observed by a security guard and a medical staff of some kind, a tech or a nurse or whatnot. Well, because of federal and state regulations, particularly state regulations around, you know, number of beds in a hospital, number of monitored beds in a hospital, what is an appropriate patient to nurse ratio, patient to mm-hmm. this. Any patient who comes in saying they have suicidal ideation automatically requires what's called a sitter for 24 hours in a hospital. Mm-hmm. So I might not be able to admit that psychiatric patient to the hospital for two days and they're languishing in an emergency department, getting more upset. And you know, now I have staff to then admit them somewhere so somebody can watch them and make sure they don't harm themselves in the hospital. Right. So like the, the the growth of the security, we've grown our physical uh, like square footage of where we place many of our psych patients in particular to manage some of the conflicts of how many patients uh, can be watched and supervised safely in with not enough staff to do so. And so we have what's called a security standby unit and the, the combination of patients that goes there and the usual protocol to get there is psychiatric complaint, plus or minus, you know, or maybe they have an intoxicant, you know, maybe they're overdose, not overdose on something, but like uh, very drunk and they need to sleep it off. Or maybe they, you know, have suicidal ideation, or maybe they are very floridly psychotic uh, and in a manic episode, or maybe they were acting bizarre outside. And so these kinds of patients, well, many of these patients need inpatient psychiatric hospitalization. Well, unfortunately, there's not a lot of space for patients who need psychiatric hospitalization across the country. This is one of the biggest challenges you're going to see in the emergency department. Everywhere you go, we don't even have enough mental health trained professionals to help us manage the patients that we we see. And so at any point in time, if you were to walk into my ER, that initial three bed like behavioral health suite still exists. We have the security standby unit which now has eight to 10 beds in it. Uh, and we have a variety of ways where we can kind of alter some of the, the care areas to increase that, particularly on days like festivals where we will kind of co-locate substance abuse or those kinds mm-hmm. of things. Uh, intoxicated kids on St. Patty's Day, it's easy to put them in a room together in some ways. It's, not, it's a semi-private situation. We don't want to violate any of that stuff. But like the, we have to kind of change our process. And it is... The, the management of this, and, and a lot of times I have to warn our brand new medical students who are coming in the rotation and seeing this, a lot of times what you're doing when patients are coming in with florid psychiatric illness or very severely intoxicated with something or whatever, you have to de-escalate and restrain them. And so if I can't talk to you and put you in this room, 
well, then now I'm going to take you to the trauma bay. I'm going to have six security guards around you. You're going to be screaming and cussing and fighting. The doctor is going to eventually make a decision to use medicines to help calm you down. We offer medicines, and I, I prefer when a patient chooses to have their own like power to do something in their own agency. But if they are not capable of making decisions and making choices in a way that help their own health in that moment and preserve the safety of what's going on in that situation, then we deem them not to have capacity to make decisions and take that decision away from them. Uh, and you're supported by that legally, but it's a very uncomfortable thing to do. And it's very jarring to hold a sick patient down, a right. mentally ill patient down, who's maybe they don't have their meds, you know, because they lost their job, right? Maybe right. they're, you know, there's they're not a bad there's a thing there <laughs> like there's right. something that you're trying to care for but before i can even care for it i have to have my security hold them down draw up meds inject them with medications you know and then wait for them to fall asleep and then while they're asleep now we can you know work them up for injuries other conditions do blood work this do a more safe physical exam many of our intoxicated patients fall down and hit their head i mean they have to do a laceration repair or something and 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 all the while they have been sleeping and then they wake up seven or eight hours later and they find themselves in a room with a security guard a few a uh, few staff and then several other patients and it's dark and they're in a gown and there's nothing it's a trauma traumatizing yeah. And all we can tell them, there's one TV and we're in a nice place. Like our, our emergency department is yeah. beautiful uh, compared to most folks, right? And all you can do is give them food, let them go to the bathroom and wait for a bed. And usually we have to transfer a patient to a bed that doesn't exist for three days from now. And by the time they have languished, haven't been able to shower, haven't been able to find the decent dignity of being a human being, even in their own crisis, they get angry. They get frustrated. Mm -hmm. They get bored. They get bored it is so boring waiting for your results it is so boring waiting for you know are they going to take me to a ct scan where's the doctor they haven't updated me and a lot of that boredom i think really does contribute to a lot of it but you know looking at, again kind of back at the just again the scope of what the the issue is and where our violence is what we put them through how traumatic it is by the time they make it to a place their acute psychiatric or psychotic need may have been treated several times by the meds we had to get them and, and they no longer have it. So they go back on the street, they start stabilized for a while, and then eventually something happens and it throws the cycle back off. And we just kind of have this rigmarole over and over and over and over again. And ironically, that's actually how I got into working a lot on homelessness, the frustration of not having somewhere to send people who are coming in addicted to drugs, needing help, severe mental illness, uh, in and out of the criminal justice system or in and under and over bridges, you know, quite honestly. Mm. And that that's just what we see a lot of. And it's a painfully frustrating scenario, especially especially like loading in the, the data conversation north. You know, my hospital's data is not going to talk to the criminal justice's data It's not going to talk to, you know, some of our city organizations data. And so being able to identify these people is a challenge being able to find them consistently in the same locations is a challenge. And then being able to provide them the resources they need to actually improve their lives and stabilize is a really, really, really hard part of the problem, especially if you can't even tell who they are or where they are, what's going on. But that cycle, they get dropped through the cracks and they're back in an emergency department, verbally and physically violent if they need to be to get what they need, which is often food, shelter, dignity, someone knowing their name, uh, human things, you know, medical care for the issue they have, a shelter. <laughs> it's just, it's, it's pretty frustrating. And I think that does a lot of injury to the people that work in the emergency department who are trying to, you know, help folks, but also in many ways question the ways in which, uh, the ways in which our system allows us to be able to do that or supports us in our desire to help folks. Security Heroes is brought to you by Athena Security. To find out more about Athena Security and how we help save lives through our weapon detection solution, visit www.athena-security.com. And then make sure to search for Security Heroes in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and Google Podcasts, or anywhere else podcasts are found. Make sure to click subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. On behalf of the team here at Athena, thanks for listening.